Thanks very much. Uh, it is great to be here. Um, Tim, I really appreciate that kind introduction, and thanks for keeping the bio very short. Nothing worse than uh, listening to somebody read your bio. Um, look, I can't tell everybody how excited I am to be back in front of a crowd, uh, even if it's a small one. Um, so hey to everybody in the room and to everybody uh, virtually. I feel like I'm with my people. This is great. I know many of you, and this is really our main constituency, so I was very excited to, to be able to do this, in particular in person. Um, as Tim mentioned, I was sworn in as the CISA director a little over two months ago, and it has really been a whirlwind. Uh, for anybody who's thinking about uh, taking on a Senate-confirmed role, I can tell you it is not the most fun process. It takes a long time to get through, um, but it was worth it, and you would want that level of rigor uh, with the type of officials who are taking on these responsibilities, particularly at this point in time. Uh, but I am really thrilled to, to join such a wonderful team. I have to say, you know, I've had a lot of great experiences in government. I spent 22 years in the Army. I was at the White House twice. I was at the National Security Agency for over a decade. And this really is the best job in government. And I say that with great sincerity because it's a great mission with great people at a extraordinary time uh, in our history, and so I'm excited to be a part of it. And before I dive in and talk to you about what we're doing at CISA and then uh, how we can use your help, I've already been asked, how can we help you? So I've got a lot of uh, asks of all of you. Uh, I just wanted to, to take a moment and extend my thanks and gratitude to our NTSC partners um, for all the work you do year round uh, to promote cybersecurity leadership and engagement uh, across the industry and government. You know, I see, because I just came from the private sector and I understand uh, and appreciate all the work that you do and how hard it is, frankly, um, and how it is uh, a 24 7 job uh, and on weekends. And, you know, I see this community as really the gatekeepers to our nation's most critical operations, whether that's uh, water, delivering water or gas or access to hard-earned money, uh, helping to deliver phone calls, deliver shots and arms. Uh, everything that this community does helps to provide critical services to the American people. So I do really feel incredibly honored and privileged to spend time with you. And I know this is just the beginning of the time that I'll spend with all of you. So um, thanks for what you do and thanks for being uh, great uh, partners. I know um, you have a mission to make the voice of the CISO heard, and I'll tell you that it's CISA. Uh, we hear that uh, voice loud and clear, and we, we will continue to be your champion. Uh, so with that, let me tell you a little bit about CISA. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm thrilled to join CISA at this moment. It really is a unique moment in time, I believe, for us collectively to make a real difference for the security of our nation. You know, in particular, with a, an administration that recognizes that cybersecurity is a true national security imperative. And it's one of the reasons that I wanted uh, to join at this particular time, because we have an extraordinary team across the board, and working with all of you in industry, I think will make us even stronger and even better. Um, and, and as the nation's cyber and infrastructure defense agency, CISA is really central to that effort. You know, it was built from the imagination of my predecessors, folks that you know well in the US Congress, uh, who created it at the end of 2018. So we're the youngest agency in the US government, not, not even three years old. Uh, it was founded by my great friend, uh, Chris Krebs. You know, it was designed to be something different, not just another lumbering government bureaucracy that I think we all have familiarity uh, with at some point in our careers, uh, but really something different, something much more akin to a hybrid public-private collaborative. And so I'm excited to try and uh, realize that vision as we continue to transform the agency. You know, the whole idea of CISA, and really DHS, frankly, uh, because it was built off the back of uh, the tragedies of 9-11, was to build collaboration into our DNA. It's about cooperation and information sharing and action, both at the uh, public and private sector, but that's really at the heart of our ultimate goal of, of raising our collective defense. So, you know, established in the CISA Act of 2018, we have two main roles. First, we are the operational lead for federal cybersecurity, so that's protecting and defending what we call the .gov, uh, the federal civilian executive branch networks. Uh, and then secondly, uh, and more relevant to this audience, we serve as the national coordinator for critical infrastructure 
uh, security and resilience. So in sum, our mission is to lead the national effort uh, to understand, to manage, and to mitigate cyber and physical risk uh, to our critical national infrastructure. And as all of you know, this is a pretty challenging mission with pretty serious consequences if we fail, but we won't. Uh, so the mission can only be accomplished at the end of the day through strong collaborative partnerships uh, with industry. And, and you know, I really believe we're at an inflection point here. Never has our collective collaboration been more important given the dynamic, complex threat environment that we are all highly, highly aware of. You know, my goal is to fundamentally shift the paradigm from public-private partnership, which we've all used many, many times in our careers, into public-private operational collaboration. Uh, and from the idea of information sharing into information enabling making sure that everything that we are sharing with each other is timely, is relevant, is contextual, and most importantly, is actionable so that it can be used by you all and your teams to ensure that you can protect your networks and to reduce risk and to improve resiliency. So that's what I'm trying to do. And in this shifting uh, paradigm to true operational collaboration, I wanna talk about a couple things, um, as I said, that I will ask for your help with. So first of all, uh, as some of you might know, we recently launched what we call the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, or JCDC. Uh, this was established as part of the NDAA as a Joint Cyber Planning Office. Uh, I didn't want to call it the JICPO because it didn't sound very good, and JCDC is actually more appropriate and sounds cooler. Uh, it's uniquely the only federal cyber entity that by statute brings together the talents, the authorities, the capabilities of the federal cyber ecosystem. So CISA, but NSA and FBI and Cybercom and the Department of Defense and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, together with the incredible power of industry to create a common oper operating picture of the threat environment to enable us to plan and exercise against the most serious threats to our nation and then to implement coordinated whole of action cyber defense plans. So the idea is to create a proactive capability for the government and the private sector to work together closely before an incident occurs. We all know that when something bad happens, heroics happen. Everybody comes together, we bring our teams, we, you know, we don't sleep, we make it happen, we reduce the risk. But at the end of the day, uh, it's really hard to make a friend when you need a friend, particularly in the US government. And so what we wanna do is to ensure that we are really strengthening the connective tissue between the government and between industry before something bad happens so that we are all working together to understand how we operate, what our processes are, what our programs are, what our policies are ahead of time and really what actions we can collectively take uh, to enable us to reduce risk to our businesses and frankly to our nation. So the maturation of our collaboration, and you know, this has started as we know, it's been decades through things like the ISACs and uh, through the information sharing that we provide and CISP that some of you are a member of. This is really a maturation of all of that. Uh, and I think it's gonna be pretty critical going forward to all of our common cyber defense operations because as you know better than any audience, uh, this is not something that the government can do alone. Uh, when I was in the world of counterterrorism, that was much more an inher inherently government thing in terms of the levers of power. Uh, it's switched in cybersecurity because so much of our critical infrastructure is owned and operated by all of you. And so this is much more predicated on a strong and collaborative partnership. So the great thing about JCDC is, again, it is purpose-built for partnerships. So we bring together, as I mentioned, our federal agency partners to ensure that things that they're doing under their authorities are aligned with our cyber defense operations. Uh, secondly, we work closely with what's called our sector risk management agencies. Uh, so places like Energy and Treasury and HHS and EPA and TSA that all have that uh, subject matter expertise on their sectors, we work closely with them. Uh, to ensure that we are reducing risk to critical infrastructure. And it, it's really, it's interesting to me and really important and good that over the past couple years, 
the government has recognized what I think private industry recognized a while ago, which is you, know, you can't look at these critical infrastructure sectors in silos. Everything is connected. Uh, everything is interdependent. Everything is vulnerable. So when we were in banking, uh, we knew as good as we could be, uh, as many billion dollars that we invested, if uh, the energy went down, if the electricity went down, if the telcos went down, it didn't really matter. So it's all about these partnerships that have to come together. It's one of the reasons that CISA uh, created something called the National Critical Functions. So we took the 16 critical infrastructure sectors and we, we um, turned them into 55 national critical functions. And it's one of the reasons why CISA's role as the national coordinator for critical infrastructure resilience and security is so important so that we are able to uh, affect uh, security and really resilience across all of those national critical functions and across all of those critical infrastructure sectors. So when we get information from one partner within the JCDC, what we'll want to do is to see uh, whether we see it in other places based on the visibility that comes from our partners within the JCDC, but then also be able to share that with other sectors. I think that's hugely important. And uh, as, as I said earlier, critical infrastructure owners and operators, as well as state and local governments, uh, bringing expertise to the discussion really gives us a unique capability to drive cyber defense in the various jurisdictions that we all deal with. So I, I really truly believe with this assembly of knowledge, we will uh, be able to achieve much deeper operational collaboration, which has to be more than words. It has to be action to really reduce risk to our nation. Um, JCDC is only about a month old. I think we launched it in August. Already we work closely with our partners to share information, to collaborate around key operational issues, and to really build what I think is most important to any relationship, whether it's a, a marriage or a, or a relationship between government and industry, and that's trust. And so as we continue to build trust, I think we will gain more and more momentum as we prove out this model. Uh, and as the effort expands, we will uh, welcome new partners in uh, to help us move from reactive response to proactive collaboration and planning. Um, now, I should say pretty clearly that while CISA, based on the authorities in the NDAA, hosts the JCDC, it really is, uh, it really is a government uh, uh, capability. It's called joint for a reason. And so it should be considered a platform that really brings together the full power of the interagency. Um, CISA's role in this is really on behalf of the nation and the American people to exercise what I think about as our superpower, and that is the authorities uh, that we have to share information widely across a variety of stakeholders, and that's very unique. And of course, it grew out of the, uh, the tragedy of 9-11, where the big lesson learned was the need to connect the dots and share uh, across a whole variety of partners. So I think that's incredibly important and incredibly powerful. And you know, as I said, even just over the past uh, month or so, we have grown the number of JCDC partners when I first announced it. So now we have about 15 plank holder partners. And, we, uh, we have those partners based on um, a, a need to have greater visibility. Obviously, if you look back at SolarWinds, if you look at Microsoft Exchange, we know that adversaries are getting smarter, more sophisticated, and they are taking advantage of the blind spots in our domestic infrastructure. You don't want the government to have views into that domestic infrastructure. We know that private industry has incredible visibility. And so we are looking to capitalize on the visibility of private industry to be able to provide uh, trends uh, in a way that we can better understand the threat environment. So I would encourage everybody to reach out to us uh, and uh, talk to us about the JCDC. We're doing some webinars and discussions around it. I'd be happy, of course, to talk to any of you. Uh, but um, before, we, if you're not already a member of uh, CISPI, which is you know, another one of our information sharing programs. I assume everybody is here, the Cyber Information Sharing Collaboration Program. That is really uh, kind of the lead into the JCDC where we are sharing information, not just the machine readable information that we share through the Automated Information Sharing Program, uh, but more contextual and uh, information through things like analytic exchanges. And JCDC, again, is really just the, the maturation. But in addition to those authorities, 
Uh, we got a lot more stuff in the NDAA. Uh, one of the other reasons I was glad to take this job, uh, Chris Krebs, I'll have to thank him. He really set me up for success. Uh, we have new administrative subpoena authority to more effectively notify companies like you uh, when we see vulnerable devices through our scanning. Uh, we're able to provide uh, cybersecurity training and education authorities to our wider audience. And then, uh, as many of you know, we're establishing a cybersecurity advisor committee, which I'm super excited about. Um, and I want to particularly thank you all for your strong advocacy and support for the establishment of the committee. Um, that is ultimately going to provide recommendations to uh, me as the CISA director on how we can effectively continue to transform CISA to be the agency that the nation deserves. So I'm really, really excited to be able to tap into uh, incredible subject matter expertise and leaders across the board to help us build uh, CISA the way we all need it to. Um, I know that you all had a call for this uh, advisory committee uh, 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 two years ago, Tim, Tim and I were talking about this at another event recently, and you know the continued support for this is really fantastic. So I was excited uh, to see it instantiated in the NDAA, and uh, we are getting after it. Hope to have our first meeting uh, probably in the, the later fall, either late October or in November. Uh, second thing, um, I want to talk a little bit about our collective journey to zero trust. Uh, I suspect most of you are way down the path on that journey. Uh, the federal government is now uh, well on the path to that journey. Uh, as we know, organizations of all sizes recognize that traditional legacy environments that we deal with depend upon a strong, uh, you know, our, our whole thoughts about depending upon a strong perimeter are really no longer viable uh, against sophisticated threats. And so uh, many of you, I'm sure, are investing in two key efforts, migrating key applications and data to public cloud and then implementing aspects of zero trust. And this is, of course, the journey that I took uh, at Morgan Stanley over the past four and a half years, and I suspect all of you are doing it as well. Um, and we know that these are essential steps for uh, national cybersecurity, and we have to take them with care and rigor. And th that's the type of thing that we're thinking through, frankly, from a, from a US government perspective. Uh, we need to figure out how to be on that journey to create resiliency while also optimizing cost. Uh, and putting in a strategy that will, in fact, make us more secure. And we know that you know, cloud is not inherently more secure than on-prem and without a clear understanding of the shared responsibility model uh, and a focus on strong configurations and collection and analysis of cloud security data. Insecurity can also migrate to the cloud if we do things like we don't configure properly. I am a huge proponent of the continued journey to the cloud, but we need to make sure that security is baked in and, and that we're doing it right. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but um, I am more asking you to help me evangelize uh, than telling you what you uh, uh, already know. Um, at the same time, we know that the adoption of zero trust uh, is essential. Uh, migrating isn't easy particularly for organizations with significant legacy. Uh, I suspect many in this room have dealt with uh, legacy in your technology stack, and we are, uh, surprise, surprise, facing these challenges today in the US government. Uh, but it's a journey we have to take. Um, so to this end, we recently published uh, two documents. Hopefully, you all have seen them. Uh, first is the Cloud Security Technical Reference Architecture, and the second is the Zero Trust Maturity Model, and that's kind of a companion document to something that OMD, OMB put out about our zero trust uh, uh, strategy. And they both provide, both these documents that we put out provide key considerations uh, for organizations to you, use public cloud and then uh, to migrate to zero trust. So um, the great thing, another great thing about CISA is uh, everything we put out, um, we are always asking for feedback on. Uh, we put something out on MS, uh, MSPs recently and I saw in CSO online uh, somebody gave some, wrote a great article about it, and so I sent her, sent her a note, and you know it's great. I love that. So please always feel like you should reach out if you see things, if you disagree with things, if you think we can make things better, if you think it's great, you can tell us that too. Um, but it's also really good to get your feedback. So please continue to do that. The comment period for both of those docs that I just mentioned goes through October 1st. So please take a look. I'm sure you can help us make them better. Uh, we love your input. Uh, third thing, uh, near and dear to everybody's heart, is a focus on supply chain. Uh, 
Uh, everybody here knows that uh, all the risks now emanate beyond the network boundary. And look, we all went through a huge seismic shift in how we operate because of the pandemic. Uh, overnight, everybody went to desks and branch uh, offices to uh, desks on the kitchen table and trying to figure out how to compete with our spouses and our kids for uh, how we were going to be able to operate uh, and have enough bandwidth to do it. Um, and then, of course, an explosion of BYOD. Um, so, you know, and then we brought in all the collaboration platforms, right? So it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty complicated time. I was incredibly encouraged and amazed that, you know, most businesses were able to make this migration. Um, seamlessly some, less seamlessly others, but I think uh, there was a great, uh, a tremendous amount of important work done by the CISO community to ensure that we could continue to do business, but keep our businesses safe. So kudos again to all of you. Um, you know, as we know with these changes, uh, there became new elements of our networks that really underpinned uh, the expansion that we're going through um, into new technologies. So I'll bet if you ask any person in this room what challenges we thought we were going to deal with, and somebody asked us in 2019, uh, it was not uh, the move to a completely remote environment. Um, but, you know, as we were able to do this, we know that um, we also increased a lot of the attack space. So it does crystallize that we have a shared responsibility to be vigilant in our attention to supply chains from large businesses to medium to small. Uh, I know every one of your companies must have a clear focus on finding and building and maintaining uh, trusted uh, relationships with service providers and software companies. Um, you know, in particular, what are we doing? So CIS is leading an effort to drive strong security controls around our most critical vendors. Uh, everybody here, I'm sure, has read the president's executive order on ensuring uh, the nation's improving the nation's cybersecurity. As part of that, we received, I think, like 35 taskings, uh, which is great because uh, we are happy to be called upon to provide our expertise uh, to help make the nation more secure. Uh, but as part of that, we were asked to work with NIST to identify categories of service providers that may present critical dependencies for networks. So we are doing that. Uh, additionally, uh, we are leading the effort to drive adoption of SBOM. I know everybody knows what that is, Software Bill of Materials. Um, so to make sure that we've got the right labeling, uh, enumerating specific packages and libraries used to construct software. I think all of us appreciate the importance of that um, and you know how important widespread adoption of, of this will be essential to, to making our networks more secure. Um, last, measuring security, which I'm sure is also something that is uh, near and dear to everybody's hearts, as I'm sure you spend time with your boards and your senior leadership, and uh, they are always asking you, well, how do I know what I'm getting for all of the investments? Um, so we appreciate that challenge. I certainly had that challenge in the private sector, um, and we are trying to figure out how to make a real difference in this space. So you might have seen uh, that recently the White House directed uh, through a national security memorandum in NSM uh, that we and, and NIST work together to develop cybersecurity performance goals that are consistent across critical infrastructure sectors. So pre preliminary goals that we're working on focus on industrial control systems, and then they're going to broad broaden to cover all the sectors. Um, the idea is uh, these goals will help organizations measure their own security and evaluate security for vendors, partners, and providers. Um, as I said, you know, I saw firsthand uh, when you have the challenge of presenting consistent and comprehensible metrics to a board or to, to business leaders, the whole idea is these goals will help us move forward in addressing all of our shared challenges um, and really help to justify the investments that we need to make as security uh, folks. So over the, over the next year, we're going to finalize the cross-sector control system goals. We're going to work with our sector risk management agencies that many of you workforce uh, work together with. And as I said, we're going to have a very transparent consultative process. So uh, we need your feedback for this. I know many of you have done extensive work on this in your businesses. So again, um, please help us uh, with this. Uh, the preliminary goals are uh, actually being published today. Yay. Uh, so please look out from, give us your feedback. Um, we're going to also do some stakeholder workshops so your folks can be part of that. Um, so, so look, just a few additional asks. Uh, at the end of the day, the security uh, of our infrastructure really relies on our partnership model and our communications and our willingness to trust each other and to work together. Uh, you know, this is an 
is, as I said several times, a shared responsibility. So I will continue to use this organization and to reach out to all of you through the variety of forums that you are all a part of uh, to help to get your help on innovating new solutions and on being an advocate for strong security, as I know all of you are, and then continue to partner with us. Um, our role is to really serve as your trusted partners and to help ensure that you all uh, have the information and the resources and the tools that you need to secure your networks and improve the security of your partners in this space. Uh, and while I know I have many uh, asks that I've given you today, and um, I'm happy to continue this conversation because I, I do want your continued help, two additional things. Um, first, registration is now open for our fourth annual National Cybersecurity Summit, which we're very excited about. Uh, it's going to air every Wednesday in October. We're going to host conversations with uh, fantastic leaders, some among this audience, uh, from government and academia and industry. We're going to talk about uh, vulnerability management. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, collaborative defense. Uh, we're going to showcase our partnerships and then talk about something very near and dear to my heart, which is how do we build a diverse cyber workforce? And that's diverse in a big way from uh, gender and sexual orientation and ethnicity, uh, tapping into the neurodiverse. We really need to build uh, teams that reflect the diversity of our nation. And so excited to partner with all of you on that. And the summits are all free, so uh, please sign up. Um, finally, happy early Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, October, as we know, is a time, is our month. We come together uh, to make sure that we are reinforcing the shared responsibility. Um, and when I go back to my evangelist point, that's something that I am gonna be looking for all of your help on. We are trying to keep it simple in October. Uh, I realize that there's 57 things that we can all do to make our businesses uh, safer and more secure, but uh, as we know, uh, that is not what business leaders want to hear. They want us to keep it uh, simple, and they want to understand uh, why these things are business risks to them and how they can make their businesses more resilient. So we are very focused on uh, one thing, and my friend Tom Burt will appreciate this, and that's all about enabling multi-factor authentication. So we're going on a bit of a uh, campaign. We're gonna talk about the other things that we need to do to keep our network safe. But I would ask for your help in promoting uh, MFA and then of course the rest of our baseline security practices that we all know so well. But I figure if we can work together and get uh, our teammates, our businesses and our people to do one thing, I would ask the, uh, the MFA. Uh, thing to focus on. So again, thank you for having me here. It's uh, been a great opportunity to spend some time with people in person. Uh, I really appreciate the partnership and I will uh, again come back to you for your help and your collaboration and your innovation uh, and your expertise. Uh, but thank you again and I look forward to uh, working with all of you. Thanks. I don't know if we have time for Q and A. Did we? Do you want me to? Stick uh, I think around? we have a question here. Oh, great! Hi, Jen. Celine. I see. Um, you already mentioned the Cybersecurity Advisory Committee. Can you give us a little bit more uh, insight and also when we expect it to be uh, operationalized? Yeah. So, aiming to try and uh, get it operational by the fall, late fall probably. Uh, as you can imagine, there's all kinds of processes for bringing people on to government committees. They have to go through vetting and all of that type of stuff. So the process is not as fast as I would like it to be. I think that sentence can apply to almost everything that um, I've experienced since I returned to government. Uh, but the idea is, that, look, as I said, you know, CIS is a young agency. Um, when I think about my good friends and other agencies, I was talking to my friend Paul Nakasoni yesterday. NSA has been around a long time. so. Um, we have great folks to, to work with across the interagency, but we really need to accelerate our maturation and our transformation of CISA. So I am finding, I'm pulling together people who have expertise across critical infrastructure sector as envisioned in the legislation at the state local level, uh, but also people who are gonna help me do some fundamental things to make sure we're setting up CISA for success in the next 50 plus years. And that's, uh, at the end of the day, a lot more about people and culture and leadership than it is necessarily about uh, technical and security issues. There's a, there's a good amount of that, but you know, I'm a technical person, I have an ops background, but I will tell you, I've spent probably 
um, more of my focus over the past nine, nine weeks in terms of uh, people hiring, accelerating those processes, and building a culture, a culture that we need to be able to not just attract great talent, uh, but to retain that talent. And so want to be able to tap into a community of people who have uh, done that really well at big companies and who have uh, built people operations. And so that, that there'll be an aspect of that as well. So I'm excited about it. And thanks again to this group for being a strong advocate for it. Hi, Jen. Pete Cronus. Thank you very much for uh, being here. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a question from our members uh, about JCDC. And so thank you for sharing your vision of the organization. Uh, the question really focuses around how uh, JCDC will uh, collaborate with kind of outside organizations. And uh, can you share your vision for that? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, we sort of started out with about 15 plank holders. The idea was to First, first principles help solve the visibility issue that we all know about. I mean, we deal with visibility issues you know, every day, right? If you can't, can't see it, you can't defend it. And that's actually a lot of what we're working on in the, F, in the federal civilian executive branch. And it's what, you know, is a lot of the work going on in the executive order. But this is more about visibility to protect our businesses and our critical infrastructure. And that's, you know, as I, as I mentioned, what we saw in SolarWinds and Microsoft Exchange, bad guys taking advantage of the blind spots that we have uh, on domestic infrastructure. As we all, you know, my time in the private sector, you all know, you know, in many ways you have much more visibility and can provide um, anonymized data that helps us understand trends better. And so that was sort of the first principles, um, was that uh, platforms that have huge visibility to help us on that. And that's not something where we're just sharing in that ecosystem, right, of those plank holders. We're actually taking that information and sharing it much more widely through our Critical Infrastructure Partnership Advisory Council, CPAC. We have outreach to all of the critical infrastructures and, of course, on our platform to state and local through our 10 regions around the country. So even if, if somebody is not yet a named JCDC uh, partner, they will absolutely benefit from what the JC is, JCDC is doing through things like CISB, as I mentioned. Um, and if folks are not part of CISB, I think we've got probably 300, and I suspect all of you are, but if you're not, um, please join or, or reach out to me about it. Uh, but what we're trying to do is also to prove out the model, right? I want to make sure that this uh, actually works well, and that means ensuring that we have uh, our interagency partners in place, ensuring that we have representatives from our companies um, that will be uh, the right folks to bring us help and, and, and talent and capability. And then we will look to increase. So again, um, first step was visibility. And the second thing we're doing is trying to turn this to enable us to work with some of the critical infrastructure providers. You're probably aware of uh, some of the 100-day sprints um, for ICS uh, that the White House is doing. We're sort of the operational partner in that. So there was the energy one. Uh, led by Bill Furman uh, at uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and now there's a pipeline one led by Alan Armstrong at Williams. And so we're actually going to look to leverage uh, JCDC to bring in some of those pipeline companies as we look to work with them to instantiate technology that will give them an ability to detect and respond to threats. So early days, I'm excited about it. Uh, but um, if there are specific questions about joining, please reach out because we've been having a lot of these discussions. We had over, and it's super encouraging as well because, you know, government isn't necessarily seen as like the, the you know, the, the greatest partner across the board. But, but I, again, I think we're at a moment of inflection. And so we've had over 125 uh, entities reach out to us. And so we're just figuring out how to sequence and bring folks together in a way where there is going to be value to them. I am keenly aware from my time in the private sector to make sure that if you're gonna spend your time uh, having a partnership with the government, that you accrue value from that partnership. And so we're being um, deliberate, uh, but we're gonna move out. Thanks. Uh, Jen, hey, Robert Ball. Um, really appreciate your comments about the public-private operational partnership, and that's, I know, key to what everybody is thinking about in here as well. Um, we were kind of, we've been around six years and, and been part of this 
back and forth in the cooperation, so very much looking for that collaboration. Um, one question we had is on the AIS, the, the platform. We were kind of expecting an update. Can you kind of give us an update on where the AIS, uh, is that still gonna be kind of the default platform for threat and sharing? Yeah, I mean, so AIS, it, it is. I think it's got 600 or so members. Um, you know, the, the value, of, we have business, we have federal entities, we have international partners, uh, we have vendors, and we share that information, as you know. Um, my experience, frankly, when I was at Morgan Stanley, is we didn't necessarily see as much value as I was expecting from it, um, and we realized the limitations of it, and so we're actually doing um, several things. First of all, we're trying to provide greater context, right? Information without context is... Uh, can waste our time, frankly. So we're, we're responding to some of the feedback that we've gotten from you all, from industry and others, uh, to provide, um, you might have seen it already, sort of MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework, kind of tagging that to all the indicators. We think that's important. Um, and then we're just looking for ways to give greater context um, and to have greater feedback in it. To be frank, we push out a lot of information but we don't receive a lot of information. So, you know, frankly, I would ask for help on that. Um, and that's just been a historic thing. And the reason I think we don't receive a lot of information is because people might not see as much value as we want it to. So that's a continued journey. And again, I would really appreciate feedback on this. Where we have pressed into more aggressively is CISB, as I mentioned, whereas AIS, we have about 600. CISB is about 300. And that's not just machine-readable indicators. It is much more context. It's analytic exchanges. It's classified information for those who are cleared. Um, and it's, it's a lot more discussion about what's out there as opposed to just seeing an indicator. Um, so, you know, there's advantages of both depending on the size of the company. Uh, but if you think about it as sort of AIS is, is the outer band, then there's CISB, and then in the middle will be JCDC, so the real kind of in-depth collaboration. And I hope that kind of radiates out. What we're doing in JCDC will radiate out to that 300 partners and then to those 600 partners so we can create a real ecosystem that, again, we'll go back to what I call information enabling, not just information sharing. And so that's the concept. Awesome. Hey, Jen, uh, thank you very much again for uh, for being here with us today, especially in person. Um, this is like super cool. So um, just two quick questions. Um, one, you haven't mentioned the NKIC yet. Um, so what is the relationship between the NKIC and the JCDC? And then second question around SBOM. How do you, how do you think that SBOM list gets mechanized over time? It's one thing to, to kind of do it once and you know what's in it, but obviously with version control and everything else, yeah. you know, do you see like a sticks taxi type taxonomy standard coming for that? Um, just touch on those two things. Yeah, I'll answer that one first. I think it's early days to figure out how it's gonna be operationalized. We were able to uh, steal Alan Friedman, some of you might know, come over and just join CISA, who's done an enormous amount of work on this. So, you know, um, we're bringing in the right experts to help us figure out how we can actually operationalize this as effectively as possible. I mean, as you know, through the EO, we're really trying to use kind of the market power of the government to help lead changes throughout the entire ecosystem. Um, so we have done, uh, we're doing our part on kind of laying out the core principles and then we will work with um, OMB and the rest of our partners and NIST uh, to really realize that. But hopefully some of you all have been part of those workshops that have been led, which I think have been really, um, really helpful. But it's really just one part of the equation, frankly. Um, and then on NKIC, thank you for asking that, Jason. So there was something out, out of the CISA legislation in 2018. Uh, Chris and team, Chris Krebs and team, led uh, something called CISA 2020, which is trying to figure out how to take uh, NPPD as a staff element in the Department of Homeland Security and turn it into a whole separate agency, which is not a trivial endeavor. And so... Uh, it was how to figure out how to build a much more integrated, synergistic uh, cyber and infrastructure defense agency. And so as part of that, uh, places like NKIC uh, actually became part of CSD, which is our cybersecurity division led by Eric Goldstein. And so now we've got uh, six divisions 
Um, we've got the cybersecurity division. We've got the infrastructure security division focused on physical security. We've got the emergency comms division, which focuses on secure interoperable communications for first responders in the, in the event of significant events around the country. And then we have horizontal. So some of you are familiar with the National Risk Management Center under Bob Kalaski. Um, that's really a real treasure in terms of uh, some of the innovative thinking around how we analyze systemic risk. Uh, we have our stakeholder engagement division, and that manages our CPAC relationships and all of our outreach. Uh, and then we have the integrated operations division. So um, what that is, so there's a big piece of IOD, which is our regional presence. We have about 500 people out in the field. And if you don't know, if you're outside of uh, the Beltway and you don't know your regional reps, um, please uh, reach out to me because we have RDs at the SCS level who are in each of the 10 regions. And then we have a full complement of cybersecurity advisors as part of the NDAA. We have cybersecurity state coordinators. So we're building a great team um, that can be helpful to you and your, and your teammates. So let us know if you're not aware of um, our CISA reps on the ground. But, but on NKIC, so what happened is um, part of the NKIC that was just the watch was integrated with the National Infrastructure Watch and the National Communications Watch to come together to form what we call CISA Central. So that is all part of the IOD, the Integrated Operations uh, Division. Um, you should not have to have a PhD in government uh, to figure out how to uh, deal with uh, the government. Um, so two things on that, you know, Chris's vision, Chris Krebs' vision was, you know, NKIC, actually people kind of got to know of NKIC, but he just said make it CISA central, make it easy. Um, and then really the bulk of those operational capabilities separate from the watch all came into CSD. So JCDC is a subdivision of CSD. So that's how it all sort of comes together and really... Um, most of what you recognize in the NKIC is part of CSD now. So, um, but yeah, it should be pretty transparent, you know, but you should just be able to call up, call CISA and get what you need, frankly, at the end of the day. It's, um, we're trying to simplify things as much as possible. Well, I think we have time for one last question. Great. Right. Thanks, Patrick. Sure. Thank you. And uh, thanks again for, for coming and speaking with us today. Um, question about ransomware um, from our membership, and uh, I'm going to tweak it a little bit. So, you know, one might argue that as uh, critical infrastructure providers, that ransomware adversaries kind of tripped into critical infrastructure, and that set in motion a sequence of events that led to things like the White House memo and a lot more specific guidance for companies. But you might say that the adversaries have figured out, okay, let's not mess around with critical infrastructure anymore. The economics are upside down there. So when you're engaging, particularly with critical infrastructure and offering guidance around ransomware, uh, how do you see kind of using that as a force multiplier to get to the rest of the private sector? And what kind of interactions with critical infrastructure are, are going to be really helpful to model and somehow you know, project out to the rest yeah. of the country? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you know, uh, who would have predicted three or four years ago what a total scourge, really a national security threat this whole thing has become. And it is kind of heartbreaking to see schools and hospitals that have been really badly affected by this. You know, we can't, I haven't heard or read about, you know, actual uh, patients dying or loss of life because of some of that, but I think we're on the, the verge of that. And it, it's something that we spent a lot of time figuring out how to uh, get get after this problem, um, and it really is multi-layered, right? You have um, all of the enforcement tools, the indictments, the sanctions when you're dealing with the convergence between nation states and, and criminal gangs. You have the pursuit and the investigation from law enforcement. We're really on what I think about as a retired military officer as a left of boom, right? We're on the resilient side trying to help people understand how to prevent uh, getting attacked or how to mitigate the damage if they do. Um, with respect to critical infrastructure, I think as we all know, it's, you know, it's variable. There are some sectors of critical infrastructure that have invested significantly and are in pretty good shape. I would say in finance, I felt like we were in pretty good shape. I suspect most of, most of your uh, companies are in pretty good shape. But some, you know, are, are not. And so this is a little bit of leading by example. It's one of the reasons why we um, are trying to bring together these platforms uh, like the Cybersecurity Summit, where we're going to talk a lot about this particular 
issue. It's why we created StopRansomware.gov as a one-stop shop for everything you need to know about ransomware. I'll tell you, like, you know, one of the things that always drives me crazy is when I have to go to 20 different sites to figure out how to get the information that I need. Um, it also drives me crazy, or did in the private sector, where you see an alert from CISA, and then you see something from FBI, and then you see something from NSA, and you're like, what does it all mean? And so um, one of the other things we're trying to do, we're actually putting out something today on Conti ransomware. Uh, it's a really good product with mitigation guidance, but also all of the MITRE attack um, framework stuff that'll help us um, be more specific about that particular strain of ransomware. But it's an NSA, CISA, FBI product. So we are more and more speaking with one voice, which is what I think the private industry deserves, right? And so we're really working on that. But to your larger point, you know, even if we solve this for critical infrastructure, what about the small businesses um, that are, you know, what we call target target rich, resource poor? And so one of the reasons why we are on this evangelism kick is to get this information out, our resources, to make it simple, right? If you if you make it too complicated, people are just going to ignore it, and use our presence in the field, our cybersecurity advisors, our cybersecurity state coordinators, to help get that information out to the state and local. Uh, level to help people understand all the things they need to do to to protect themselves and stop ransomware.gov had an amazing amount of hits and so I think people are starting to use those resources but this is truly a problem that all of us have to come together to work together on it's it's whole of government whole of nation and then frankly it's an international issue so I've had these conversations with a, um, a NATO colleague yesterday. I was in the UK meeting with my um, NCSC teammate last week. I met with the uh, folks from uh, ACS, uh, ACSC. So really, this is something that we're all talking about um, and something that we've got to come together to, to um, make a real impact on. So thanks for the question. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much.